Look great. <laughs> I didn't have heard that. Uh, continue. Hey, you cannot move a video while people are spotlight. Okay. Dean, can you hear us? I can hear you now, yes. Now, is, he seems to be muted. Okay. No, I'm not can muted. Can you hear us? I can hear you fine. But we can can't you hear, hear you. Well, I don't know why. No, we can't hear him. One moment, please. Joe, can you hear me? You're just fine. Just give me one minute. Okay. No, I have no idea what you All right, let me know when I can try it. Are you just in New York now? Or no? Okay, then give me a few words. Yeah, test one, two, three. Can we, can you say something? Yeah, I am, test one. Ah, there you go, okay. Okay, we hear you. Okay, great. Good evening, everyone. If you could just give me your attention for a moment, please. Thank you so much. We'll be gathering in the gathering space for the first time since March of 2020 for a Morbin program. So this is a momentous historic event. And um, to that end, we're excited that we have Dean Norton coming to us live from the kitchen at Mount Vernon, a uh, little, little scene spot at Mount Vernon. Um, and because you're here in our little green room that we have prior to, we're gonna be having the virtual program with his presentation and everything starting at 6.30. But for you special mm -hmm. folks that ventured out here, um, Dean has a little pre-program and a little special quiz where you can win prizes. So um, you all have sheets of paper on your chairs. On one side, there are recipes for two of the things that you're, two of the items that you're eating or snacking on tonight. One is the punch. So if you had some punch, you've got the recipe to recreate it at home. And if you had mushroom sauce in the little phyllo cup, that is also, these are from the Dining with the Washington's book. And uh, Dean is gonna refer to that. But tonight, um, when Dean's ready, I'm ready, he is gonna say hi and start his quiz. Okay, can, can everybody hear me all right? Yes. yes. All right, great. You all look lovely there. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Uh, I am in the family kitchen here at Mount Vernon, and uh, I'm with uh, Adam Irby, who's our curator of fine and decorative arts. Uh, he's watching over me, uh, which is great. Love having him here. So if you have any questions along those lines, he'll jump right in and answer. So I'm going to give you all a quiz, and there'll be 15 questions. Now, I want you all to um, not look at each other's papers because they're valuable prizes for the top three uh, folks that get the most answers, okay? And that will be a copy of the book, Dying with the Washingtons, which is a, a great book. And uh, so much of the information I'm sharing with you tonight came from that book. And uh, so we only have uh, about 15 minutes left. So we're going to get started. Do you all have a piece of paper and pencil? Okay, so I understand you all have been enjoying um, some of the, uh, a couple of the recipes from that book, which is really, really cool. Was, was it good? Yes, I can't hear them, Joe, so. Um, yeah, I know. Uh, if, you, if you could turn your light on when you have a moment. If I can what? Turn your light on. Turn it off. Um, we gave them the punch. Oh, the punch. So they're all liquored up. Oh, good. That makes this taco so much better. Come 
There you go. There you go. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> okay. Okay, better? Yes. All right, you ready for question one? Yes. Remember, keep your answers to yourself. You want to win one of these books. George Washington lived in the White House. Is that true or false? Say one more time, please. George Washington lived in the White House that our president's in today. Is that true or false? Okay. Number two. Washington was the only president to be inaugurated in two cities. What were the two cities? What were the two cities? Correct. I hope you weren't asking me, hoping I was no. correct in the answer. I, I, am, I am reiterating loudly for the room. Okay, that was very cute. All right, number three. What was George Washington's salary as president? Was it 15,000, 25,000, or $35,000? What was his salary as president of the United States? Any of that sounds pretty good to me. Okay, let's see. One, two, three, four. All right, number four. George Washington considered himself foremost to be a politician, a farmer, a general, or a common citizen. So what did he consider himself foremost to be? Politician, farmer, general, or common citizen? You guys must be doing great. No one's going, hmm, or, <laughs> or at least I can't hear you. Uh, number five, by his presidency, how many teeth did George Washington have at that time? Nearly all of them, five or one? When he became president, how many teeth did Washington have at that time? Nearly all of them, five or one? All right. How about this one? Did George Washington wear, Washington wore a wig, true or false? Did he wear a wig? Did he wear a wig, true or false? Number seven. George Washington's religion, what he considered his religion was it Baptist, Episcopalian, or Presbyterian? So was it Baptist, Episcopalian, or Presbyterian? If we had already if we had already read the book, would we know the answers? The dining with the Washingtons? Yes. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> okay, number eight. What temperature does our 18th century baker that's here often? like to have his oven when cooking bread? 350 degrees, 425 degrees, or 500 degrees? So, so when our 18th century baker's here, he has his own little oven, oven he takes around. What temperature does he cook his bread at? Is it 350, 425, or 500 degrees? And how does the 18th century baker know? <laughs> He, he just does. It's like the gristmill guy. How does he know when the stones are just right? And how did all those artisans back then know what was right and when if they just were really, really skilled? Um, in the smokehouse, what was not smoked in the smokehouse? Beef, ham, venison, or mutton? What was not smoked in the smokehouse, beef, ham, venison, and mutton. And I may have to get a clarification with, with Adam over there, I don't know. When, when I give you the answer, he may have a correction for me. <laughs> okay, ready for number 10? I think it's number 10. Um, 
Now, this is not a multiple choice. At Morristown, New Jersey in 17, 1777, George Washington took the bold move to inoculate his troops against what disease? He inoculated his troops in 1777. Lots of ahs with that answer. <laughs> oh, okay. Lots so, of people know, are ooing and eyeing over that oh, one. Good, good. Okay. We like ooh and ahs. What did he inoculate his troops to protect against what disease in 1777? Okay. All right, here we go. What is the only fruit that has seed on the outside of the fruit? What's the only fruit that actually only has fruit seed? seeds yeah. on the outside? Right. Uh, let's see. 10, 11. Okay, number 12. What was Washington's favorite dessert? Was it Martha Washington's grape cake, ice cream, apple pie, or assorted fruits? Okay, so number 12, what was his favorite dessert? Martha Washington's great cake. I think there's 16 eggs in there, maybe 18. I don't know. <laughs> A lot of eggs. Um, ice cream, apple pie, or assorted fruits? All right. Number 13. We're in the home stretch. Yep. Washington traveled outside the United States only once. Where did he go? Was it Bermuda, Quebec, or Barbados? He traveled outside the United States only once. And was that Bermuda, Quebec, or Barbados? Okay, um, 14. George Washington received royal gift from the King of Spain. Was royal gift a sleek schooner an Arabian horse or a donkey? He received royal gift from the King of Spain. Was it a sleek schooner, an Arabian horse or a donkey? All right, number 15. The library company of Philadelphia was founded in 1731 by what founding father? This is not a multiple choice. The Library Company of Philadelphia, so you got library in Philadelphia, two keywords, was founded in 1731 by what founding father? And then, then that's 15, we'll get one extra credit here, okay? <laughs> if anybody has any uh, questions about the questions, we can go back. In public, Martha was known to call her husband, Mr. President, General, or Mr. Washington. What did she call him in private? George, Ooh. GW, <laughs> old man, or my hero? So what did George, what did Martha Washington call George Washington in private? Was it George, GW, old man, or my hero? Okay, so any uh, repeats of anything, any questions? Okay, once again, silence from you, peanut You're gun. not eligible to win anyway. <laughs> okay, All let's, right, so uh, here we we're go. on the honor system for scoring your own sheets. Right, in the top three, I'll, I'll and if there's a tie, maybe I can. I cannot tell a lie, you have to. That's right, you can't tell a lie. All right, Washington did not live in the White House, that's false. So he did not live in the White House. That's correct, false. Well, um, a lot of people. All right. The two cities that he was inaugurated in was New York and Philadelphia. New York, New York and Philadelphia. All right. We knocked some people out there. Okay. All right. Washington's salary was $25,000. Two people got that right. All right. That's good. All right. He turning into a horse himself. race. What's that? Okay. <laughs> he's, he's turning into a horse race. Hmm, okay, go ahead. Good. He considered himself foremost a farmer. 
He had one tooth by the time of his presidency. Washington, uh, did he wear a wig? That's false. He did not wear a wig. <laughs> Linda? Few people. All right. Okay. Number seven, he considered himself an Episcopalian. Okay. Our baker likes to have the oven at 500 degrees. Yeah, a couple, good. That doesn't take long for him to, to uh, cook those bre pieces of uh, uh, breads either. All right, um, now this may be a correction here. The smokehouse, there was no venison smoke. He did not, they did not eat venison here. Okay, there's no, nothing from Adam, so I must be okay there. <laughs> All right, what was the disease, number 10, that Washington inoculated his troops? It was smallpox. Yes. Uh, Washington's favorite dessert, number 12, was ice cream. Ice cream. What was number oh, sorry, 11? Did we I'm skip sorry, one? That's, All right. That's, that was 12, that was 12. Uh, number 11 was a strawberry. Okay, so so 11 was strawberry, 12 was ice cream. Washington traveled to Barbados. A royal gift was a donkey. And it was Benjamin Franklin who uh, founded the uh, library company of Philadelphia. And lastly, for extra credit, was um, Martha was known to call George Washington old man. Um, <laughs> so, did anybody get a hundred percent? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna start going down the line, add it up. We'll see what we get here. Um, let's see. We probably don't have fifteen. Anybody get 13, 12. Oh, 12. one. Wow. Okay. okay. That's one. Get get that name. Very good. Are we are we counting the extra credit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. We have okay. one winner how, so far. How about eleven? Two. Two. Or a second winner. Oh, second winner. Okay. Uh, and what was that? Was that eleven? Was that twelve or eleven that she had? Eleven. Okay. How about ten then? Okay. Whoa. Wait, we had two, we had two 11, so we have our three. But the rest of you get to eat George Washington's mushrooms and drink his punch. Okay, let's just, <laughs> okay, so we have our three. How many had, how many had 10? Looked like a lot of people had 10. Who had 10, folks? Wait, I couldn't hear you. Could you repeat yourself? How many people had 10? How many people had 10? Two more. Two more, okay. We'll get their names too, okay? Okay. The rest of you are, uh, well, I'm not gonna say you're losers, but you, you all did very, very well. <laughs> all right. Okay, we have four minutes before we let in the masses on the shared Zoom. So if you wanna refresh your drink or get another ham biscuit or a mushroom, Yummy thing. <laughs> I don't know what we're calling that. Uh, now is your moment, and then we'll start the presentation. We're so delighted you're here. It's so nice to have people in person. <laughs> What's up, Dean? Yeah, are we just are we going to be able to make sure that the folks coming in on WebEx or Zoom are going to be able to hear? Okay. Yeah, W will take care of. Great, good. Thank you very much.
Get the problem. You got enough power on your cell phone? Because I got a thing here for cell phones. Okay. What's going on in your world right now? What's the it's amazing. So you all can actually start installing? We're not going to start installing yet. We could if we wanted to, but the installation will start. Wrap it up? As far as the rooms? No, we've got, um, we're going to move from there to the study and the Washington Bed Chamber. And then the Washington Bed Chamber first, and then the study. And then we're the, the additional two are this small dining room, which I don't think really needs much. It, from the first curve side, it needs a little bit more. Um, and then the downstairs bed table, we want to redo that to well, that one. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. Any cool finds uh, or, or searches for furniture like you did with the bed and some of the other things? Absolutely. So today I went down to Richmond and to John Marshall House, and they have one of these two by line coolers like the ones that Washington had. And there's a have a history of having been owned by Washington, but I went down there and it descends through Marshall's sister. And it's a Washington one. It is. Really? It's, it is. <laughs> it's a pretty good one. So that was a pretty fun time. Are we going to buy it? No, it's, they, their museum owns it. And they're going to probably talk more about it now. So. Wow, that's very cool. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Letting everyone in right now. We're so excited that you're all here. Welcome, welcome. We've had an amazing time. We're sorry you weren't able to be with us. Uh, we had a little quiz, a little refreshments, a little party, but um, you will all get some recipes when we send you the recording from today. So very excited to be here this evening with Dean Norton and he's live. 
Hopefully you can all see him. He is live from inside the historic kitchen at Mount Vernon. Um, Dean has been with Mount Vernon for how many years? 52. 52 years, which is amazing since he's, you know, only 40. So um, to introduce and get uh, our evening rolling this evening, I want to introduce our board chair, Liza Morehouse. Thank you very much, Debbie. Welcome, everybody. Um, as Debbie said, my name is Liza Morehouse. I'm a trustee. I'm currently serving as chair of the board of trustees. And we're thrilled to have you all here. And we're thrilled to have everybody in our Zoomiverse, which is <laughs> well, wonderful uh, that we can have outreach and have all kinds of people with us and in Mount Vernon and here in Princeton and all over the country. Um, you might wonder kind of so what's with Washington and why is Morvan doing something about Washington? Well, you may or may not know, and some in this room I know do know, um, that uh, George Washington and Anna Spudno Stockton were pen pals and had a great affiliation and admiration for each other. Anna Spudno Stockton, a woman of the uh, mid 18th and late 18th century was a published poet in her own time. And many of her poems were heroic elegies and um, letters of, of grateful thanks and um, adulation of the patriotism and the her hero hero heroic nature of George Washington. And she published those and sent them to him. And he, that's fine. I mean, you know, some gals, you know, send me fan letters, but he actually responded and they did have a mutual correspondence and a mutual admiration and in George Washington's words, actually a friendship. So this, this book is um, written by Carla, edited by Carla Mulford. It's only for the eye of a friend. It's available in our gift shop. <laughs> <laughs> Should you wish to get a copy. But this is actually a letter that's published in the footnotes of a poem she wrote and sent to George Washington. And he wrote this letter back to her uh, from Philadelphia, June 30th, 17. 87. Madam, at the same time that I pray you to accept my sincere thanks for the obliging letter with which you honored me on the 26th, accompanied by a poetical performance for which I am more indebted to your partiality than to any merits I possess by which your muse could be inspired, I have to entreat that you will ascribe my silence to any cause rather than to a want of respect or friendship for you. The truth really is that what with my attendance in convention, morning business, receiving and returning visits, and dining late with the numberless personages, etc., which are not to be avoided in so large a city as Philadelphia, I have scarcely a moment in which I can enjoy the pleasures which result from the recognition on the many instances of your attention to me or to express a due sense of them. I feel more, however, than I can easily communicate for the last testimony of your flattering recollection of me. The friendship you are so good as to assure me you feel for me claims all my gratitude and sensibility and meets the most cordial return. With compliments to you and your good family, I have the honor, et cetera, and then is signed George Washington. So it is not um, unexpected that perhaps at some point the Stocktons may have dined with the Washingtons, but if they didn't, perhaps this is what it would have been. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you and welcome and enjoy the, the uh, yeah. I just want to add a few words. My name is Jill Berry. I'm the executive director here at Morvan, and I want to thank you all for coming. Um, this is our grand experience in our first hybrid um, event, having people both on the screen and in the audience. So we're hoping this works because we want to do it more and more often. But I want to thank Elizabeth Whistler, who's in the audience here, for bringing Dean to us about a year ago. And Dean so generously offered a tour of Mount Vernon to Morvan and May as one of our auction items. And I will tell you, I bid on it furiously against a former board member and won. <laughs> <laughs> I was not going down and really got to spend the day with Dean. And he is, I'm delighted to share 
his uh, great sense of humor with you all tonight. Uh, it was supposed to be like, oh, like a two hour tour. I was at Mount Vernon for eight hours. So that can just show you how captivating Dean is. So without further ado, welcome to Morvin, Dean. Thank you. I don't think we were together for eight hours, but, um, but we had a great time. It was wonderful. So can you all hear me okay? Whenever you're ready to share your screen. Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot screen. about that. Okay. Are we good? We're great. So far so good, right? Mm -mm. Yes. No. Five or no. Okay, may I continue? All right, we're ready. We're ready, anytime you are. All right, cool, very good. So um, it's a pleasure to be with you all. I, I am in the historic kitchen here at Mount Vernon. And I wanna thank Adam Irby for being here with me, allowing me to do this. He's curator of the of fine and decorative arts here at Mount Vernon, does an exceptional job uh, in all that research. and. Um, so it's getting colder in here. <laughs> I started with this shirt, but I have my jacket on now. We'd love to put a little fire going in that fireplace, but I don't think that's allowed. So um, we're gonna talk about dining with the Washingtons and, and I do encourage you to, to get the book if you can. It's a wonderful book because dining with the Washingtons was a very special occasion here at Mount Vernon. Uh, Washington always talked that his life and what he had to offer was basic, common and modest. For instance, he wrote that my manner of living is plain, a glass of wine and a bit of mutton is always at the ready. Such as will be of partake of it are welcome. Those who look for more will be disappointed. Now he may have been talking a plain game, but Mount Vernon developed into an elegant and industrious estate. Now he obviously had higher expectations for a ball that he attended in Alexandria, Virginia. It was most definitely plain, and he recorded that fact. He wrote that he went to a ball at Alexandria where music and dancing was the chief entertainment. However, in a convenient room detached for, for the purpose abounded great plenty of bread and butter, some biscuits with tea and coffee, which the drinkers of could not distinguish from hot water sweetened. Be it remembered that pocket handkerchiefs served the purpose of tablecloths and napkins, and that no apologies were made for either. I shall therefore distinguish the ball by the sight and title of the bread and butter ball. Now in this presentation, we're gonna focus, I'd like to focus on the kitchen garden. I am the horticulturist here. And there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, in the 18th century, horticulturists said that the kitchen garden is the most useful and consequential part of gardening. Indeed, it was necessary to support life. Gardens producing vegetables were called gardens of necessity. For that reason, they were necessary for health and survival. Now, the second reason was that Martha, probably one of the, the best quotes that we have, uh, for what she said, she said that vegetables are the best part of living in the country. So, I really want to focus in on that. Now let's go back to the colonists. And I, you know, you wonder how did they survive back then? Well, they were able to hunt and fish, of course, and the cultivation of corn and wheat were critically important as well. But vegetable gardens were very quick to follow and they were planted. But what did make a successful vegetable garden? Well, first of all, exposure. You wanted to make sure you had a southern exposure. I don't know why. I see I have a blue line on my screen. I have no idea where that came from. Can you see, can you all see that? I must have drawn that, sorry about that. Uh, so Southern exposure was very important. This was on the south side of the Bowling Green. And with that in mind, when Washington planted the trees around the Bowling Green or Serpentine Avenues, none of that shade interrupted with the growing of the produce within this space. Protection was very important as well. 
Now, even in Jamestown, one of the first laws that were passed was once you plant your garden, it must be protected. You have to build a fence or something to keep animals from, from destroying it overnight. Now here at Mount Vernon in Washington, when it went a bit further, he surrounded his with a brick wall. Not only did it protect it from animals, but it also created a microclimate. So you can start your gardening early in the season, earlier in the season and extend it further into the fall, which was really, really important. Fresh vegetables were just so special to be able to put on the table for the evening meal. Good soil was critical and Washington was way ahead of his time as far as the use of compost. Even uh, as, a, as a young person in 1760, he, he uh, writes out a science, basically a seventh grade science fair exhibit where he picks 10 different composts and experiments with them to try to see which is the best. Now he found that Black Creek mold was the best, which of course was the hardest to find, but uh, sheep manure came in a real close second. So he cultivated a lot and added compost, which really helped the vegetables uh, in that garden. Ease of planting was important too. In this garden, if he had not terraced it, it would be a, a relatively steep slope right on down to the river. So having a garden where it's relatively easy to work, it makes it a lot more enjoyable. And of course, the gardener can be more efficient. So kitchen gardens early on were, Washington's gardens were very simplistic. Actually, his entire design was. You'll see that the gardens here are, are rectangular in shape. And that's the way they were until 1785 when, um, when he changed his landscape, which we'll talk about in just a bit. Most of the gardens back then were, were almost all universally the same. They were uh, four squares with, with walks in the middle. A lot of times around the outside, they would plant other things as well. Uh, and then of course have a fence. Now at Bacon's Castle, uh, archeologists, now this is a 17th century historic site and archeologists revealed a garden that supported six squared beds, which is really amazing. That is, as you can see, the house up the upper left. This is a huge garden. And those squares would have had an awful lot of uh, plants in there, a lot of different produce. But Bacon's Castle is actually the oldest uh, documented brick building in the United States, dating from 1665. Now, someone like a George Washington uh, was able to hire gardeners to assure a successful harvest. And these were professionals. They were trained in horticulture. Over the uh, life of George Washington, he had numerous gardens, gardeners, and they came from England, Germany, Scotland, and America. One of the first gardeners that arrived, his name was Peter Green, and that was in 1765. Now, early on, Washington was simply looking for a good kitchen gardener. Although he said if he knew something about fruit trees and inoculation, all the better. Now, what he meant by inoculation was propagation, if he was able to propagate plants. Now the longest serving gardeners were Philip Bateman. He was from Leeds, England, who worked in the gardens from 1773 till 1789. And Washington said he was one of the best kitchen gardeners to be had. Jonathan Christian Eller, or Eller was a German gardener who worked in the gardens from 1789 till 1797. And as far as his credential, credentials were concerned, he was probably one of the more accomplished gardeners that Washington had. Although the best gardeners to be had in the 18th century were Scottish. Uh, they were sought after for their great work ethic, reliability, and their frugal nature. Their apprenticeships included coursework beyond horticulture to include chemistry, geology, and meteorology. They also broadened their skills by taking dancing, chess, backgammon, fencing, and music. So they were incredibly well-rounded. And Washington finally got his Scottish gardener, William Spence, in 1797. Now, there were also um, enslaved gardeners that were a constant presence in the garden enclosures. Uh, the two years of weekly reports that we have from the gardeners, the last two years of Washington's life, they identify Cyrus, George, Moses, Peter, and James planting and harvesting and cultivating within those gardens. Now, when Frankly the butler and Hercules the cook had idle time, they helped in the gardens as well. Now, this is an image that we thought for many years was Hercules Washington's 
uh, chef. But through a lot of different research, we can now say that this is not Hercules, although it's a great rendering of a chef from the 18th century. Is that correct, Adam? Yeah, so it is from the 18th century, but it is not Hercules. Very sad day that when we found that out. Now, after Washington won our independence from Britain, there was a significant change to Mount Vernon, to the Mount Vernon landscape. And one thing I want to say about Washington during the Revolutionary War, uh, we really do get an indication of how important he saw the cultivation of vegetables. Uh, that was George Washington, because during the war, he pressed that his troops eat vegetables as often as possible, because he knew that would lead to better health. And he also said that during idle times, he thought that soldiers should plant a garden. Now, I don't know when those idle times would have been. More often than not, they were retreating. And the only idle time I know of was during the winter encampment. So that would have been kind of tough to do. But after Washington won our independence, he was admired, he was respected. Basically, he was worshiped. I mean, they wanted him to become king. So Washington was real big on first impressions. And he wanted his landscape to be more of a reflection of the man that he had become. That simple landscape just wasn't gonna work anymore. So Washington defeated the British. He didn't really even like the British, but when it came to choosing a landscape style, it was gonna be English. And Washington really liked the naturalistic design principles that were being taught by this gentleman named Batty Langley in his book, The New Principles of Gardening. And this is what Washington wanted to emulate. He wanted to emulate these naturalistic design features. So changing from formal to naturalistic completely altered the gardens as well as the entire surrounding landscape. Now Langley, as you can see, is gonna teach someone how to landscape in a more grand and rural manner than has ever been done before. And there are four key principles to a naturalistic design. And they are, the curved line is nature's gift. And uh, let's go ahead and take a look at what, that, the, what the garden was. And uh, this is what it changed to. But anyway, the four features are the curve line is nature's gift. That was the most critical. Management of surprises, hidden barriers, and random planting. So when Washington laid out this bowling green or, or grass plat in front of the mansion, the garden walls were now pushed back to the north and to the south. So they were much more squished together than what they were. Now, the curved line was brought about through the serpentine avenues and management of surprises could be utilized very well with these curved walks because around each bend, you would see or could see something different. Batty Langley wrote that once you've seen one quarter of your garden, you should not have seen it all. There's nothing, nothing more shocking and stiff than a regular garden. Also, he wrote that anyone walking in full sun more than 20 paces will certainly not enjoy their stroll. So Washington planted forest trees on either side of the Serpentine Avenue. Uh, hidden barriers, now those were important because Washington created vistas. Uh, he said, uh, cut a vista to the west to the forest beyond. And the reason hidden barriers were so special was because they didn't interfere with this view. And what was a hidden barrier? What was a ha-ha wall? Classic naturalistic feature. Um, that uh, definitely Washington included a number of them. As a matter of fact, at each, each point of the con compass is a ha-ha, and um, so that everything within those walls, which was called the family living area, would have been protected from animals. They wouldn't have been able to get up there and graze and destroy the, the turf, which he would have been grooming on a weekly basis. So the kitchen garden uh, was, well, let's see, both gardens changed in shape, but only one in purpose. The garden walls went from being squared or rectangular, and they looked like, in the end, a cathedral window or bullet, let's see. So here's the plan that was done by Samuel Vaughn uh, and given to Washington as a gift in 1787. And you can see the new shape of the gardens. You can see all the curved lines now, the straight lines have been abandoned. And uh, as many of the naturalistic features that Washington could, uh, adapt from Batty Langley's New Principles book he included within the landscape. Now the kitchen garden um, did not change. 
uh, even when they change the boundaries. And it has been providing fruits, vegetables, and berries for a continuous 261 years. Baron Ludwig von Klosen, an aide de camp of General Rochambeau, said that there was an immense, extremely well cultivated garden behind the right wing of the house. The choicest fruits in the country are to be found there. So that's certainly the kitchen garden, the upper garden, which is the garden to the left. Now that was planted in 1762 as a fruit and nut garden. But in the new 1785 landscape that was transformed to a pleasure garden. And a pleasure garden was a garden to display flowers, not for their use, but just for their beauty and their enjoyment. And it was intended to be a highlight. Well, there's kitchen garden. Sorry, I can't see the next slide. Let me uh, move on. So this is the upper garden and this would have been a highlight of someone's stroll uh, around the gardens and grounds. A wide, nice wide 10 foot path. People could come in as a group. You have the beautiful conservatory at the end. But Washington was, he wanted this. He wanted that aha moment within his landscape. But his only concern was that he was going to lose space in the production of vegetables. So he read on in horticultural books and the horticulturist back then allayed his fears saying that, don't worry, you can do both. That plant your vegetables and then surround them with a border of flowers. And the border is actually the pleasure garden. And that's exactly what he did. And we actually changed this garden completely when we realized what the design looked like about around 1990 or so. And uh, it was really probably one of the more exciting projects I've ever been a part of. So Washington with this new design and, and as popular as he'd become, he knew visitation was going to increase. And he wrote that he expected, a, he expected an abundance of everything within the gardens. He ordered that the house would be crowded with company, that the ministers from France, Great Britain and Portugal in succession intend to be here besides many other strangers. And indeed they came. Washington called his home a well-resorted tavern. Dagon, I'm sorry, this is the, uh, the garden, uh, the upper garden after our completion. And you can see the vegetables planted in the center and how they're surrounded with the border. And it really turned out quite beautifully. This is the third season after we planted the garden anew, um, when I said it's 1790s, I'm sorry, 1990s. So Washington called Mount Vernon a well resorted tavern. People traveling north to south, south to north will certainly stop by here. He also wrote, unless someone unexpectedly drops by, this will be the first time Martha and I dined alone in 20 years. We don't think it was 20, we think it was more like 13 or so, but anyway, 20 sounds pretty good. But Southern hospitality was the real deal. People traveling North typically had a, a better chance of going from town to town without too much difficulty. But when, go, when you started heading South, some of these plantations were separated by 15 miles, 10 miles, 15 or more. And so you needed to stop at the nearest plantation um, to, to be put up because you couldn't make it to your next destination. A guest from England said visitors came from all parts of the world. The house was open to rich or poor. He never let anyone go away hungry. And he always set aside an amount of money each year for those in need. One Northern visitor actually wrote that Virginians are so kind one can scarce know how to dispense with or indeed accept their kindness. And there was one story of a man that came, he, was, he had dinner and he couldn't stop coughing. And Washington said, can I get you some tea and honey or something to help you? He said, no, I'll be fine. I'll just retire early. Well, there was a knock at the man's door before he uh, fell asleep. And indeed it was Washington himself with a tray with, with tea and, and honey. And, the man was overwhelmed. He, he could not believe it. And he wrote that a little incident occurring in common life with an ordinary man, uh, no one would even take notice, but as a trait of the benevolence and private virtue of George Washington, it deserves to be recorded. And when one traveler wrote, with every most distinguished mark of kindness and attention to hospitality, indeed seems to have spread over the whole place with happiness, kindness influence. I mean, if people were just overwhelmed with the hospitality. And uh, when someone would have visited Mount Vernon, uh, they would have been greeted by frankly, the butler at the door. Depending on your social standing, you would have either been uh, asked to enter the family parlor 
which was been the front room to the left. And if you didn't have a letter of introduction, uh, maybe you were a little lower on the social uh, level, you would have just been in the, the, the hallway until someone would have greeted you. So regardless of your standing though, you would have had a roof over your head and you would have had a meal. I mean, that's just the way it was. And what about the meals? What, what were they and, and when did they come about during the day? Uh, breakfast was served at 7 a.m. Uh, dinner was at three. In between meals, you could get snacks of both sweet and savory uh, items. Washington, the night before, typically would have had a sandwich made if he, he was on site. And he had a sandwich box that he could carry his sandwich with him in his rides around the estate so he didn't have to come back to get something to eat. Sunday dinner was typically an hour earlier so that the servants had a longer afternoon off. Now they were called to, uh, uh, so anyway, I'm always one slide behind. This is uh, an image of the family with Frank Lee uh, in that image. He's the gentleman that would have greeted you at the door. And let's see, the dinner bell, we're at the kitchen. This is where everything would have happened in preparation of the meals. Uh, the bell would have been always have been rung 15 minutes before uh, whatever meal it was to be served. Uh, so it was a warning. And Washington was very prompt. He liked to eat exactly at those times, I said, although he did at times give a five minute uh, grace period. Now during the hot summer months, the 7 p.m. tea uh, was more than likely served on the piazza where you had a nice breeze and probably cooler temperatures. Now, Washington's bedtime was nine o'clock and he had no wine at night because typically that might cause him a headache. So he, he stayed away from the wine. Now the kitchen had three different rooms and this is where I am right now. The main room with the fireplace and the bread oven. Uh, fireplace is quite significant. You have a spit, you can have several things uh, going on there. You could take coals and spread them on the floor and take the, uh, the cooking implements and the legs and put them over the coals. So you could have several things being warmed, uh, continue to be cooked all around the room. Now, one thing that I understand, one of the responsibilities of children often was to be in the kitchen to watch the cook because she uh, had, female cooks had, uh, long dresses and they might get caught near the coals and could catch fire, their clothing could. And so they would be there to help put that out. You can see the bread oven over to the right. We know now that the baker may want that at 500 degrees. Uh, so anyway, you had that room and then you also had um, the uh, scullery where food was prepared and dishes would have been washed and uh, a larder where it had a subterranean cooling floor where it would have kept things cooler for longer periods of time. Now the chefs, uh, Hercules, Dahl, Nathan, and Lucy, uh, they all worked in the kitchen and they would rise at 4 a.m. every morning uh, to get things prepared, stoke up the fire at 4.30. The housekeeper typically arrived around five o'clock to make sure everything was on track. And at six o'clock, Martha would check in with the kitchen. By 6.30, they're making hoe cakes, coffee, tea, and chocolate. And 6.45, the bell would ring, and at seven o'clock, Washington would sit down to his favorite breakfast, which was hoe cake smothered in honey and butter. So Washington uh, started his day off right with the breakfast, and then he would greet his hounds and his horses, and then ride off to, to check his other four farms and make sure everything was going according to plan. So this is uh, one of those implements uh, in the kitchen. You can see how they could have things all over the floor to to spread out things, to be warmed. A lot of things can be going on at one time. And this is uh, another good picture of the kitchen. That's Washington's, Martha Washington's great cake, uh, quite significant. As I said, I think there's 16 eggs in there. I tried to emulate that once. Uh, I, my wife was making uh, uh, poppy seed brownies or, or cook or muffins for our teachers. We did it almost every year, they loved them. She was very tired and I said, go ahead and go to bed, I'll make them. Well, they called for three eggs, but it looked like eight to me. So those muffins got 16 eggs in them because I doubled the recipe and um, they were okay, but we lost two teachers, unfortunately. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> um, so let's see. There's no doubt that the uh, enslaved workers did shape the taste of the household and the region actually. 
Many iconic Southern dishes bear influence of the West African cuisine from stews like gumbo to ingredients like okra, sweet potatoes, peanuts, and collard greens. Now, you're a visitor to Mount Vernon and you've spent the day strolling the gardens and grounds and, and now indeed the highlight was the evening meal. Uh, that event was the role of the mistress of the plantation and that was Martha Washington. If it, wasn't not, if it was not abundant and elegant, it was a direct reflection on her. Now, Martha was a very keen plantswoman. Her um, first uh, father-in-law was John Custis. He had one of the finest gardens in Colonial Williamsburg. As a matter of fact, the book New Principles of Gardening was in his library and she may have actually suggested Washington buy that book, we're not sure. But she had, was in constant communication with the, with the gardeners because she needed to know what was gonna be available for the next day so she could plan out the meal. She was making sure that seed was collected, vegetables were planted and harvested at the right time. Now Washington was away for 16 years of the 45 years he lived here eight years during the war and eight years during the presidency. And her communication was often, because she was more often than not with him wherever he was. And her communication was often in the last paragraph where there were a few lines from Martha to the gardener. Some of what she requested, uh, one time she wanted some lima beans, which uh, Martha Washington desired to be given to the gardener. She wanted a gardener to send her some artichoke of the best kind. She really liked artichokes. And she asked Old Doll uh, to collect rose petals to make rose water and also mint to make mint water. And both of these were used for flavoring uh, during cooking. Uh, let's see. So um, it has been said that no aspect of human endeavor has been so neglected by historians than as home cooking. Unfortunately, few scholars were cooks and fewer, scholar, and fewer cooks were scholars, were scholars. So there's been a lot of that uh, great information lost. But um, the book of cookery and the book of sweetmeats that Wa Martha Washington held from 1759 until 1799 is truly a treasure trove of culinary secrets set down by mothers and grandmothers of some of our uh, early, earliest colonists. It's believed that this collection of recipes dates to the 16th, uh, 17th century, sorry. Now, obviously some of the recipes are for historic, just for historical reference, but as time passed, recipes improved with the use of fresh herbs uh, being more common, sugar more readily available, and butter, oh my, it was better used in copious amounts. And beyond the improved ingredients, there certainly was more skill and perception with the modern cooks. Now in 1747, a book by Hannah Glass uh, became one of the most popular books in England and also in the colonies for the rest of the century and beyond. With this modern cookbook and others that were becoming more available, Martha Washington's book of cookery actually just be became an, a family heirloom. Now in these books, there are many recipes for meats such as pork, rabbit, mutton, and beef. No less than 13 ways to prepare different fowl, including sparrow, now that would have been a hard one to eat. There are fish recipes galore and berries of all sorts were always a welcome addition to the table. Let's see what's next. Ah, there we go. You can imagine the, the chef, the, the gardener just bringing this into the, to the kitchen for the evening meal. Now you would think, um, that you've just returned from a uh, produce section of Safeway and Food Lion or Harris Teeter when you review the recipes for vegetables in these books and also what the gardeners were preparing. And we know what they were preparing again by those weekly reports that were given to George Washington so he knew what was happening. Now in those reports, here are just a few of them. March 17, 17, 98, William Spence wrote that to his gardeners or wrote that his gardeners planted kidney beans, peas, onions, and carrots, et cetera, in the lower garden. On April 21, they were digging and transplanting horseradish and planting peas and beans as well. June 2nd, they were dressing the flower plants, planting beans and celery, weeding onions in the high garden. There are only, now this is interesting, we, there was a pleasure garden, but there are only two mentions in those weekly reports where they ever talk about tending the flowers. 
because vegetables were indeed the most important plant that they were cultivating. There were three vegetables that if they were grown uh, on any or served at an evening meal, you knew that there was a professional gardener because it took more skill to grow them. And those vegetables were artichokes, asparagus, and celery. And they were grown, all of those were grown here at Mount Vernon. So knowing what was available, Martha, Martha could plan the evening meal with the cook. And it would be, appear that often she would read the recipe uh, to the cook making that meal. Uh, some of the greatest records we have are uh, visitors' accounts from the time. They truly are a Polaroids to a historic past. Amira Am Frost from Massachusetts provided us with a delicious account of a Mount Vernon evening meal after enjoying what he said a very good dinner uh, on the evening of June of 1797. He wrote it included a small roasted pig, boiled leg of lamb, roasted fowls, beef, peas, lettuce, cucumbers, artichokes, puddings, tarts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The dinner concluded when Washington offered a toast to all of our friends. And a year and a half later, Joshua Brooks described how the food was even arranged on the table. A leg of boiled pork at the head of the table, a goose at the foot, and in between roast beef, a round of cold boiled beef, mutton chops, hominy, cabbage, potatoes, pickles, fried tripe, and onions, among other things. Now during dinner, let's see what we got next. During dinner, wine, porter, and beer were also offered. Uh, he said the tablecloth was wiped for the second course, which included mince tarts, tarts and cheese was also served. After the tablecloth was removed, port, Madeira, wine, and two kinds of uh, nuts, apples, and raisins were set out. Three servants attended the eight people dinner uh, that night. Now, I would imagine that maybe the eight person dinner would have been in the new room or the large dining room. Uh, because it was the smaller groups that would have been in the smaller, uh, more a decorative room. Adam, what do you think? Do you think it would have fit eight in the, the more the special room, more appointed room, or do you think they would have moved? I think they could have done either one. They could have done either one. There you go. So thank you, Adam. Uh, one kind of interesting note is that uh, more often than not, brief pairs were, uh, prayers were offered before the uh, beginning of a meal and at the end of the meal. Uh, let's see, a French uh, guest in 79 had commented with delight in his journal that for the first time he tasted preserved strawberries that were beautiful and large. I indulged in eating a few of them and have been fond of them ever since. Now the trick for Martha Washington was to maintain this level of setting a full table even after the gardens had been put to bed uh, in the wintertime. Now this was accomplished by storing root crushers vegetables such as turnips, radishes, potatoes, carrots in layers of sand in the full basement. Now this is the basement here at Mount Vernon and those that set of doors and the door jam are actually from the 18th century. Behind those doors is where the, um, all these root crops would have been stored. Martha saw that, uh, well, there was a problem with these stored vegetables. They could be damaged by freezing by, by dampness and by rodents. And Martha saw that keeping the space sanitary was crucial for success. She had frankly the butler clean and whitewash the cellar on a couple of occasions. And also Washington set up a series of drains to make sure there was no standing water in the house to keep the basement from being too damp. To prevent freezing, uh, frankly, would produce long litter, as they called it, and placed it along the walls and the windows to help insulate the basement. Uh, and we presume that this was straw and corn stalks they would have used. Now, between five and 700 bushels of potatoes and 100 bushels of turnips were stored in one of these vaulted uh, stone sections of the cellar. So it's, it's pretty amazing how much would have been in there. Corn and peas would have been dried and placed in containers. Meat was smoked, fish was salted, fruits were preserved by candying, drying, pickling, and by making jams, jellies, or canned whole. Another key to preserving, especially meats, was ice. Uh, that was critical. And Washington had two ice houses. One was an ice pit, which was in the basement of the mansion. The ice pit didn't work very well because 
um, it didn't drain. And, and so that did not make that efficient. If it didn't drain, the water would melt and the ice would melt even faster. So he built a, an extensive ice house, which you're looking at here, uh, which was at the south end, at the, I'm sorry, east end of the South Haha Wall. And it was really cavernous, 20 by 20 by 20. And Washington wrote to William Pierce in 1794 that he was in hopes that during the last spell of freezing that he was able to fill the ice house. So it was really critical to help them store uh, preserved meats because uh, if you, once you butchered a hog or, or anything, that meat would not last long unless you had uh, plenty of ice to, to keep it uh, fresh. We understand we have records that the ice could be maintained in those structures until mid-August, which really wasn't too bad. So some of the really special, oh, and this is the, um, this was the tunnel that would take you into the ice house. Not sure how it was really used, maybe for cleaning it out in the, uh, in the fall, because it's not at the correct uh, elevation for draining. So Mount Vernon is a really special place. Washington said it was one of the sweetest spots in the world. Uh, this is a painting done by Benjamin Latrobe. Uh, people love to visit. They love strolling the gardens and grounds. But that evening meal, that was really something to, to uh, look forward to. And I'll tell you, if I ever find a time machine, I want to come back at three o'clock. Uh, and then maybe after that, go see the gardens. And these are just some of the dishes that uh, you'll find these images in Dining with the Washington's book that um, actually are, are quite lovely. Uh, the pea soup, the, the soups have become much uh, better uh, over time. And the onion soup, looks pretty good as well. The, uh, the uh, Yorkshire Christmas pie uh, with a hearty lay layering of uh, poultry, bacon and fresh uh, produce uh, encased in pastry. That was uh, really, that looks very, very good. I could definitely eat that. I don't know if that's real or fake, but boy, oh boy, it looks good. And what about uh, fresh crab meat from the Chesapeake Bay? Martha Washington loved this, one of her favorite dishes. And, uh, and then of course my favorite ice cream. I love ice cream. Uh, Washington uh, bought a ice cream machine in May of 1784. He paid one pound 13 pence uh, for that. And uh, I'm making homemade ice cream all the time. So he was definitely a kindred spirit as far as that was concerned. And, and there's my blue line. But anyway, uh, that kind of uh, concludes Martha uh, was very proud of her Virginia hams and bacon. Uh, you know, one thing that's kind of cool, we started growing hemp uh, two years ago for the first time since Washington's time. And of course, all the reporters were saying, did, did George Washington smoke uh, hemp? And of course, my classic answer was no, the only thing he smoked was good old Virginia hams. So let's uh, see if there might be any questions. Uh, I'll stop sharing the screen here so I can see your lovely faces. Thank you so much, Dean. And I want to just um, really thank you. This is wonderful. <laughs> thank you. And I want to invite our live audience. I will come around and if you have a question, you can we can get Dean to answer. But also I want to invite our virtual audience. If you have a question, please put it in the chat. And we will get to those as well. So, okay, Jill Barry has a question. So, based on Facebook this week, was the dining room really that green? Yeah, it really was. Um, you know, years ago, uh, we had a gentleman come uh, to do paint samples throughout the house. His name is Matthew Mosca, and he needed a space to work, and he shared my office. And uh, he was able to get paint samples almost in every room. And you were able to go back through the pigments uh, each time that room would have been painted. And I remember distinctly when he found the pigment of that room and he goes, Dean, Dean, come here and look at this. And it was the, the brightest green imaginable. So yes, and I looked over to Adam, he shook his head yes too. Um, and what's really amazing during that time when we were changing the coloration of the house, I would go give lectures to garden clubs and I was attacked by the women in the group. What are you doing with those mansion colors? Why are they so bright? So 
I had to tell them I had nothing to do with it. I was just the horticulturist. But anyway, um, I, I've got to tell you, the work done here at Mount Vernon by our preservation uh, folks, our, our curators, it's just top flight. It's exceptional, the research that goes into everything that goes on here. So sorry for the long-winded answer. No, that's great. Um, we do have another question here. So the black and white rug that was in the dining room, is that, was there a story about that? Is that true to its time? Is Black and white rug. The black and white, it was black and white hold checkerboard. On, hold on one second. Can you come talk? Yes, you in the dining it? room. No, I'm, this is Adam Irby. He's cool. Hi. That is an oil cloth. Um, that is an oil cloth. They were very common in the 18th century. And they often had them um, because it's basically a piece of canvas that's painted about 10 times in 10 layers. And what's wonderful about it is it's easy to clean. And so the Washingtons, we know bought them, but we don't know that they had exactly that pattern, but it's something that, that was definitely in the group of things that they could have had. Oh, oh, thank you so <laughs> much. Questions for Adam. He's amazing. I'll just sit right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, what, hold on. All right, we're going, we're going live here. We're going in. Uh, you know why they didn't eat venison? I'm, I'm sorry. Why did they, you know why they didn't eat venison? Or is it that they just didn't smoke it? No, it, it is the most surprising thing. Washington would not hunt venison on his property. He did not allow people to hunt them on his property. And he did not eat it. Now, when he was in the forest, when he was on an expedition of some sort, of course he ate venison. I cannot answer that. It, it totally boggles my mind. And then he even had a deer park. He surrounded 18 acres with a high stockade fence and stock them with uh, English tame deer. I mean, to the delight of all the guests. Now the gardener, of course, was dealing with the other thousand that were bounding everywhere, you know? And, and actually there's a, a reference from Lund Washington, the land manager writing to George Washington saying the gardener says it's either the deer or the plants, you know? So what can we do with these rascals? And so it's, it's really kind of interesting. Thank you. I saw another question. Oh. Hi, Dean. It's Elizabeth. I just want to ask you, could you tell me about the preserving vegetables in sand? What type of containers would they use that would hold the sand? And how just, deep would they go? And how would they move them around? To Basically, um, what I envisioned, Elizabeth, is it was basically like a, a, a root clamp. And a root clamp early on was something that could have just been outdoors. And they would layer their vegetables in between straw and other things that would help insulate it. And the thing about a clamp was then you'd have your potatoes, your turnips or whatever. You'd take your fork and go through the clamp and you'd have everything you would need for a stew or what have you. So they weren't in containers. They were actually just uh, layered in there as far as I can tell. And uh, and covered in sand. Do you, do you have any thought about that? Yeah, there just there just was no mention of that. I would think it was just you would just go through and, and get it um, as you went further and further into the uh, the vault. Uh, I saw another hand up. Did I not see another hand up? Oh. Yeah. Hi, I'm one of them. So Thomas Jefferson's famous for his garden notebooks and his writings. And I was just wondering if there was any communication between the two Virginia gentlemen farmers. And was there any rivalry? Was, you know, can you tell us anything about that? Well, there's definitely been rivalry in the recent history. We played them in, in uh, softball and we are ahead two games to one. Um, I would love it if you all ever mentioned that insignificant historical site to the Northwest of us, uh, say Monticello, they hate that. Um, but Washington and Jefferson did communicate more on farming uh, related activities, agriculture than, than gardening. Jefferson was a real gardener. I mean, he had his gardening book and kept amazing records as far as what he grew and the success and the failures. Um, I would say Washington was 
uh, more advanced as a farmer uh, than Jefferson. Uh, so that was their main bit of communication. Uh, they didn't really get along too well. As a matter of fact, Martha Washington said the two worst days of her life were the two times Thomas Jefferson visited Mount Vernon. So. <laughs> Well, I, I have one, uh, Dean, just because I've visited with you. I know you talk a lot about the growing on the uh, property. What about distilling on the property? Yes, um, we have a very happy staff. Um, we have started distilling, I think, about 10 years ago. Uh, it was, we knew where the, the distillery was. Uh, it was destroyed, of course, and the archaeologists found the original uh, foundation where the stills were, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, George Washington not only had a Scottish gardener the last two years of his life, but also ended up getting a Scottish uh, land manager. And um, that gentleman, James Anderson, convinced Washington to do a still. He, Washington first said no, but Anderson was, would not let it go. And finally he let him do around 600 gallons, sold it immediately. And uh, the next year, the last year of his life, he had five stills running and made 11,000 gallons, nearly 11,000 gallons of whiskey, um, which he sold all of it. Uh, I think it was valued at a little over $7,000, but the actual profit was around 1,700, which is still quite amazing. Uh, the aging process at the time was uh, in a wagon from the distillery to Alexandria. So it aged for about, I don't know, an hour and a half. Um, <laughs> it, was, um, it was, but it's, it's really good. It's really good stuff. Uh, the, we have right out of the still, twice distilled, and then we have aged for two years and aged for four years. We have brandy now. I think they just made a rum. Um, anyway, it's, it's really very, very special. And they're distilling now. And it's an exciting time when they do it because the grist mill's just cranking out the corn and it's just rocking and rolling. And the, the distillery is just full of smoke and steam because all those fires are going. It's, it's really exceptional. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, this has been a delightful evening. Oh, wait, one more, sorry. After uh, Martha and George passed, what was the history of Mount Vernon? Ah. Well, there were um, Bushrod Washington inherited the property um, after uh, both Jean, uh, George and Martha Washington died. And then I think there were three other Washington family heirs that had it um, until, uh, was it Ann Blackford Washington? John Augustine Washington, that's right, I'm sorry. John Augustine Washington had it, and this is that is when the Ladies Association uh, approached him to purchase it. They formed in 1853, finally convinced that John Augustine to, to sell it in 1858. But between that time, I think that's that's a great question. Um, the property very early on started to deteriorate. Uh, we have visitors' accounts throughout that time, and even after the first year, uh, people say the garden and the landscape looks nothing like it did. When the general lived here. So um, everything started kind of falling apart. People just were taking stuff. Uh, horrible. They just wanted a piece of, of whatever they could get from Mount Vernon. So uh, although I will say there were also attempts for planting and care as well. They, uh, there are a number of trees within the historic area that date from 1812, 1818, 18 you know, during that time period. So there was planting going on, but there just, there weren't the means to keep it up like it was during Washington's time. So, so we leave it to the ladies to save everything. <laughs> Girl power all the way. <laughs> so, well, Dean, I wanna thank you so much for your time. It was a delightful evening. So thank you all for joining us. And I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you all so much. And I want to remind you that you will be getting a recording of tonight. Uh, and those of you who won are going to be getting things in the mail.
So watch for that. And thank you all again for coming out and we'll see you for Festival of Trees and Grand Homes and Gardens. And so keep an eye out for all good things. Thank you.